Uh, welcome at our evening about Shell, the power of Shell and other multinationals. What's the role and influence of large companies in our world and how can we, uh, governments, societies, universities, etc., uh, control those big companies in a better way? We have two speakers tonight. First, the bigger picture by Huub Ruel. And secondly, Marcel Metze about one particular company. He wrote a book about it. Hoogspel, political biography of Shell. Uh, the two talks will last for about 30 minutes each. So we will have room enough for questions and interaction. Uh, let me first introduce Dr. Huub Ruel. He investigates business diplom diplomacy, corporate governance and ethics at the University of Twente and at Tilburg University. And he just mentioned he also does this in Spain. Is that correct? Okay. Other countries? No. no. Uh, But you are a little bit multinational yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Multinational uh, ZZP. Nee, niet waar. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> uh, Multinational ZZP, you know? <laughs> ZZP, yes, yes. But what is the translation? Yeah, exactly. ZZP. Self employed. In Self employed. Self employed yeah. person, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, he will share his options um, to tame the multinational corporations in this year and in the future. Please, a warm applause for Huub Ruel. Thank you so much, Hiska, for introducing me. Thank you so much for um, joining in. Also, a special thanks to Marcel, already up front now, because it was Marcel's book that, uh, yeah, you know, okay, it was you who contacted me because you were looking for an academic who could give some sort of a reflection or the bigger picture uh, after you uh, just, I mean, you just did not finish just your book, but your book was on the market and, and you were interested in, in trying to uh, organize debates on the issue. Be and then uh, I immediately was super, super, yeah, sorry for, for, for using these <laughs> extra, extra words, uh, impressed by um, Marshall's book, The Political Biography, A Political uh, Biography of, of, of Shell. And uh, just now, and I'm saying it right now because I really wish not to forget to say this, that I think it was an instant classic and this book really should be on the, uh, the reading list of, of, of every management, business ethics, business and management kind of program at uh, universities, uh, just to, 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 to open a debate on, on the issue of the role of multinationals in our society. That brings me to the title indeed that um, I've chosen for my share in, in opening up the debate, because that's actually our, our purpose, uh, taming the multinational corporation in 2024 and beyond. And we were just Marcel was actually accusing me, Hoop, you're quite ambitious in using taming the word, taming the multinational. And I'll show you just, up, just within a few minutes that it was not me who just invented it. I copied it more or less from uh, um, somebody else who uh, already in the mid 70s published a book uh, with the name Taming the Giant Corporation. So it wasn't, it wasn't me, so to speak. Um, this is me. Uh, this is Okay, perhaps the least important, but at least we always need to, you know, a uh, bit of, you know, talk about our credentials and what have been, uh, we have been doing. In my case, I've been in academics more than 25 years, but over the past 15 years, I've been working on uh, topics like economic diplomacy, commercial diplomacy, and business diplomacy. And business diplomacy, I got triggered by that word, business diplomacy, because our type of field, business management uh, uh, um, studies and scholarship, is sometimes sensitive to fads, to, to hypes. You know, when we create a new word and we think this is a new thing. And, and when I saw a colleague of mine 
whom I later on got to know very well in person from Geneva, writing an article in an academic journal on business diplomacy. I thought, yeah, you know, that, that sounds like lobbying. And that's why I got interested in like, okay, let me then investigate and be the first one who starts a, a, what we call an exploratory study into the concept of business diplomacy. Let me indeed go out there to multinational corporations and ask them, what do you consider to be business diplomacy? And we did that. We chose in those days 10 uh, Dutch multinationals and among them was also Shell, Royal Dutch Shell in those days. And um, what we figured out is when we confronted the, the, the heads of government relations and, and our communication uh, um, offices, or uh, in, I think we never spoke with really the CEO, but anyway, in most cases, we got responses like, oh, business diplomacy, yeah, that's building relationships with government, non-government, and stakeholders. And in order to safeguard, in the end, to safeguard the reputation of the corporation. That was for me like, yeah, but that's the confirmation that actually what, what business diplomacy means is lobbying. Nothing wrong in it, whatever we think of it. I mean, yeah, we can have different uh, opinions about lobbying. And, 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 but so I felt like, no, then business diplomacy for me is not that. It must be something different. Um, and uh, that brought me to also looking at, at the, the topic that I will touch upon in my 25 minutes left for now, uh, would like to address. Taming the multinational corporation. I'll end up with discussing once again, but just now already immediately introducing to you the three options that in my view we have when it comes to taming the multinational. Uh, and that's, uh, first of all, we can choose for uh, business external measures, we can choose for legislation, rules and regulations as a society, we can have government interventions saying like, you know, for example, multinationals are not allowed to become bigger as not mentioned any size. We can choose for business internal measures, we can ask for businesses themselves like, guys, you know, don't you think that something needs to be done because we've got a problem here, um, the checks and balances, or we can choose for what I consider, but not so often discussed, what I call a societal or cultural change as well, alongside other measures. Um, and that means that we could reconsider the way how we have been thinking about business and management and entrepreneurship over at least the past 30 years in our societies. I'll get back to that later on. First of all, we've all been reading this, <laughs> or heard about this. <laughs> I would consider an audience like this perhaps uh, just two days ago. Uh, the EU will uh, launch uh, probes in, and will start investigating Apple Meta or Meta and Al Alphabet because it, it, it's, it's using, it's abusing, according to the EU, abusing its market power. And the platforms on which we sell, uh, buy our apps, and, and uh, the, the, these businesses are being accused of, 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 of not letting just everybody giving, you know, the level playing field. Um, and that's a landmark thing indeed, and an example of a governmental or a societal kind of an intervention in order to break call it the market power of a multinational. Get back to that later on. First of all, the multinational today, in today's world, how many of them do we have? <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah. Uh, uh, globally, globally. <laughs> No, I, no, just let me show you this. doesn't matter. I mean, really, I've heard different answers. What we see here is that today, um, when it comes to at least uh, companies with more than 250 employees, which are considered then in this graph as uh, large corporations, we have more than 351,000 worldwide. Uh, that's, for me, at least a lot. Uh, so we, but more interestingly, I find, and, and that is for us a bit of a mirror that helps us also to reflect on ourselves, and later on I will try to address that, and then Marcel will uh, help us further on in this storyline, is that that amount doubled, the number doubled in, since 2000. 
So what I, you know, here we are 2000 and here we're now. So in 25 years or even 20 years, the number of multinational corporations, large corporations, doubled globally, which is, in my view, absolutely significant. I think it never happened somewhere before. Um, now, and the reason why, again, I'll hope that I'll get to that later on. But this is a significant thing, in my view. And we need to realize it. So we've got plenty of large corporations worldwide. Another interesting thing is, uh, Today, we're, this evening, we could even say, what is wrong with the multinational? Is there something wrong with the multinational? Do we have a problem with the multinational? Because if we look at them, they're all do-gooders, right? I'm not a... If you look at our students also, we're here. I mean, if you're searching for uh, great jobs and if you look at the uh, corporate websites of any multinational, you will find that they're... Uh, involved in corporate social responsibility, ESG investment, eh, and environmental, social governance investments, all of them. Eh? Stock markets, indexes, ESG and, and CSR indexes, it's all over the place. So, wow, so what's wrong with the multinational? They're do-gooders. And if you look at even how the number of them that report on sustainability, of the large corporations, almost 100% reports on their sustainability. So, you know, they're transparent, they share us in what they're doing. You know, I'm sorry, I mean, you're not, you know, but I, I try to make us realize, you know, the world we live in. But that, at least impressive, one could say that. Once again, back to those corporate websites, you will, all of them will have a nice set of values. We are integer. We value honesty, sustainability, all of them. Nothing wrong in it, but yes, they have. You know, if you can find a significant large co uh, company that doesn't have those kind of like values, please call me. I would be interested because that's unique, I think. Um, and we live in the world where even... The G20 and the OECD, the Organization for Economic uh, Collaboration and, and Cooperation and, and Development, uh, think tank, Paris-based, 30 largest economies and members, you know, that those leaders have endorsed the principles of corporate governance to promote corporate sustainability. Once again, I'm trying to address the issue, do we have a problem with the multinational today? So what? And yes, now. I think we do have a problem. So let me be clear on that. Um, and then the question is, what is that problem exactly? Uh, then we can say it's size, it's power, it's, it's their activities, it's their behaviors, it's their <laughs> political behaviors. Marcel will give us a full-fledged uh, storyline and uh, in, in the history of how, how Shell has, has dealt with that. Um, but in my view, it really depends on the answer to that question, what is the purpose of business in society? For many of us, we will say, like, it can be, the answer can be, that's obvious, isn't that? Okay, perhaps, let's agree. Uh, let's agree that the purpose of business is to serve society, that more or less we all would agree, yes, businesses are there to do something for society. Uh, but then the question is, how to arrange this? Is this by focusing on profit? Is it by focusing on uh, shareholders? Is it by focusing on stakeholders? Is it by focusing on communities? What is it? How can we arrange that if we more or less agree that the purpose of a business and multinationals is to serve societies, how can we arrange that, that this happens? And how can we avoid that these things also happen? Corporate scandals, uh, or Marcel knows <laughs> more about it even when it comes to, um, I'm sorry for, for people who have a history with Shell, I, I'm, we, we, there's nothing wrong with, with doing business, uh, but the history in Groningen is not the nicest part of Shell's history, perhaps, uh, to say perhaps the least. Uh, how come that this can happen, that this could happen? Is it only Shell, by the way? Is it also governments that have been involved and have been doing things? Is it society that was too slow in responding? Anyway, but these things have happened. How can they happen when we live in a world where corporates all say, we are so sustainable, we are all do-gooders, etc.? 
The answer to the question is, as I said, depends on the answer to the question, what's the purpose of a multinational in society? And then we get to the field of corporate governance. Currently, I'm also investigating it, real life myself, with my own feet and hands in the mud, let's say, to learn more about corporate governance. And when it comes to corporate governance, that's a term that more or less for, for the first time was used somewhere in the 70s. But yes, it reflects what it says. How can we govern the corporation? How can we, uh, how can we manage, how can we govern a corporation? And then, again, to my question, to ensure that it serves society. For that purpose, and for that sake, I would love to just recall a bit of history. No, this will not be a history lesson, but I think that we can learn from history. Because although we may think that we have a problem that is perhaps unique, it seems not to be the case. Yes, I think we have more multinationals than we ever had before. However, that we've struggled with how to get them to serve society, that question is at least 100 years old. And here, what we see is the cover of a book um, by Berle and Means, 1932. The quote, 1932. So that's about 90 years ago. The economic power in the hands of the few persons who control a giant corporation is a tremendous force which can harm or benefit a multitude of individuals, affect whole districts, shift the currents of trade, bring ruin to one community and prosperity to another. 1932. Berle and Means felt that uh, the hands, that the governance of a corporation was too much in the hands of managers and executives and that they were not serving the interests of Shareholders. Shareholders in the early uh, 20th century became so-called dispersed shareholdership. Nowadays, we have very much this financial association with shareholders. Yes, that's correct. However, shareholdership was, um, in the 19th century, very much uh, uh, colluded in the hands of, of, of large shareholders, family owners. And then, at a certain point, got to uh, it, it, it was an idea. Let's let's disperse shareholdership. Let's allow each and every one of us to buy shares in a corporation because then we all have a stake in a corporation, and that will help corporations to behave decently and serve society. One hundred years ago, we're speaking, you know. So, and Berlin Means saw that this was actually not happening because still there was corporate misconduct. And they said, we need to bring the shareholder back in power in order to control. The idea was like shareholders will direct corporates in the uh, correct direction. It was also interesting that already 100 years ago, we started to talk about the corporate, the social responsibility of the corporation, something that became big from the 80s, 90s on. And nowadays, every corporation is involved, but you know, already years ago. In the 70s, again, the, the debate about how to tame the, the, the corporation uh, got, um, again, after the bankruptcy of the Pennsylvania State Railways, one of the largest firms in the United States. Uh, uh, the, I think the firm went bankrupt somewhere in the 60s, 70s. There was such a huge issue, like how could this happen? The analysis, the answer was... Uh, bad management, executives and managers that didn't serve the company and shareholders and society, they were serving their self-interest. Ralph Nader and um, uh, colleagues said, like, we need to change this, taming the giant corporation. And again, they thought we need to put back, uh, 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 we need to, to improve the monitoring, the checks and balances internally. Let's put the board in, in a more powerful seat, the board of directors, and they will then oversee the actions of the executives, and then we get the corporation back on track to serve society. Economics. Icons in, uh, in economics, uh, two uh, economists, uh, Milton Friedman and John Kenneth Galbraith. 70s, hot debate. One thought, we need governments to intervene because corporations, they are rule, ruling us. It was John Kenneth Galbraith who really said, like, actually, what we altogether need is not what we really need. It's corporations that make us believe that we need it. Something that we also, I would say, can find nowadays in the world we live in. 
but he was the one. Friedman said, wait a minute, the best way for a corporation to serve society is to be profitable. Later on, even labeled as the Friedman Doctrine, 1970, he published, I mean, in every management and business course, MBA course, you will find Milton Friedman and, and references, uh, reference to this kind of a thing. The, 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 the best way for a corporation to serve society is to make profit, to be profitable, 1970. And in my view, this is a key turning point, because here we, this is the, 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 the key for, for, I think, the evening and also where we later on will open the debate, because in my view, we still live in that perspective. We really, the Friedman doctrine became, uh, one could say, the, 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 the basis of what we started to call neoliberalism. But actually, what happened was we, we opened up the economic liberal um, paradigm again, full fledged uh, in the 80s, 90s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we believe that international liberalism uh, is the way to go, brings peace and prosperity to the entire world, and uh, based on the belief that if businesses, free trade, open trade, um, businesses should be profitable, uh, that will, will, will help us and serve society best. Uh, and that is still the paradigm that we live in. Despite corporate social responsibility, ESG investments, in the end, corporations always need to answer. Uh, I mean, even CEOs feel the pressure. If their financial performance is not on par with the peers, they will be pushed, you know, kindly asked at one point in time to say thank you so much. Uh, earlier this evening, we discussed the, 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 the um, example of Danone. We all know Danone, uh, the French uh, multinational. Uh, just two years ago, fantastic example. It was considered by the French government as a, gov as a corporation with a purpose. The CEO really wanted to be a purposeful corporation. However, its financial performance did not meet the expectations compared to Unilever and Nestle. A group of activist shareholders bought, uh, 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 let's say, a, a percentage of the shares of Danone and forced themselves into the, 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 the corporate debate on the direction of the company. And these activist shareholders said, we don't care about your strategy. That's fantastic. That's yours. But financial performance needs to be on par. So thank you, CEO. What are you going to do about it? And in the end, you can all track and trace it, Google it, the entire story. Uh, uh, left the company he g and my, uh, yeah, gave his seat and, and, and just stepped down, let's say. And, and the, my question then would be for all of us also, so what happened in that situation was that a corporation like Donone, 100, over 100 years old, started as a family business. So a group of activist shareholders thought that it knew better what is good for Danone than actually the knowledge and experience of a 100-year-old corporation? That's an interesting thing. For me, it was. It, it, it's, but that's the world we live in, and that's a priority. And I also would not love only to, to point the finger to others, but also to ourselves, because the fact that what I call this shareholder, um, um, uh, uh, shareholder profit or uh, maximization, shareholder value maximization paradigm dominates is not only uh, because businesses need that or something, we all are reinforcing it as well, in my view. Via legislation, US corporate law basically still says shareholder you know, need to be served, the business purpose of the business is to serve shareholders, whoever they are, but shareholders. Culture, we live, we've lived, also this university with its entrepreneurial history, uh, entrepreneurship is fantastic human activity. However, the flavor of it can differ. Um, uh, you know, we all know the joke like when you're 20, I see here the young generation, and if you don't have yet three or five startups on your name, you've more or less already failed. You know, like we're, we're collecting the startups, we hope to sell it as soon as possible, retire early when we're 30 or 40. You know, this kind of a. It, it, it's, it, 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 it slowed down in my view, it, it, but, but it was really some sort of in the 90s, early 2000s, it was, it was the thing. Uh, 
so culture, institution do the same, education, business education, although we have corporate social responsibility in our business and management courses, however, in many cases, it hardly ever discusses what's the purpose of business. Is it profit? Is it is profit a means to an end or the other way around? It, it, yes, it's slightly being discussed, but not fundamentally. Uh, education, therefore, but also media. Media likes to, to report on financial performance, preferably rather than to say, okay, this, this firm this year is the, the most sustainable. Yes, nowadays it gets media attention. However, if financial performance is not on par, as I just said, anyway, you know, stock market decides what, 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 what will happen. So we are living a culture as well, and we are reinforcing it, although we wish, I think, to pull ourselves out of it, but it's hard. So, uh, and that leaves us with the headlines like these, and um, that brings me again back to my options. Um, so what options do we then have to tame the multinational, since we do have that problem, we have uh, many of them, we live in a world where we yeah, absolutely in the hands of, of either the shells, but in my view also the Googles, the Facebooks, the Medas, the etc. It's really hard to avoid when you buy a new phone and when it uh, uh, uses Android, it's really hard to avoid Google, you know, you have to work hard to... <laughs> phew, uh, nah, okay. Um, so what are the options to get ourselves to tame the multinational and to, serve, to, to ensure that it serves society better than it has been doing in many cases up to now? And then again, back to the three categories of options. Uh, that's either we can choose for business external measures, we can ask governments to intervene. We could decide when corporations become too big which is a serious option, in some cases still being discussed. I think in the US still there is somewhere a, 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 a proposal in politics, you know, going around to, to break up uh, Meta, Meta uh, because it became too big. Uh, probably the so, same with Alphabet. I'm not sure about the latest on that debate, but that was because it became too big. It started to control too much of it. Uh, so governments can interfere. Governments can um, uh, buy shares, become large shareholders themselves, uh, uh, like the Dutch government did with KLM, by the way. Whatever exactly the purpose was of that, but it did in order to be in better control of what the direction of the corporation. Um, we could choose for business internal measures uh, that could be uh, enforced by external measures to say, okay, better monitoring. Uh, many of those things, for example, have happened. Eh? Think about the internet bubble burst. Do we remember some of you in the early 2000s? We do. <laughs> 25 years ago, the internet was emerging and everything where you would use the word e, e-business, was hot. So. Plenty of us tried to develop business plans with an E, and investors were happy to invest. But many of those cases seem to be empty business plans. Very hard. And, and in some cases, you had companies or corporations that even became big, but as easily with, uh, they cooked the books even in such a way that it looked more than it was. And that bubble burst, and that brought such... Uh, yeah, a, sh a shock that indeed measures were taken and the, the Americans were absolutely also there with their uh, Sarbane Oxley Act that, uh, that asked, required companies to be much more transparent on um, their uh, bookkeeping. Uh, then we had 2007, the financial crisis. Yeah, you know, <laughs> again, you know, many of us, yes. It, it, it resulted in the Dodd-Frank Act in the US and in, in Nederland, it, it coded Tabaksblad, for example. Uh, so measures have been taken trying to take control and to really try to govern and to tame that multinational in, in what it was doing. My option would be the following, and that's open for a debate, and then I'll uh, finish off, and I think uh, more or less uh, I've was uh, uh, it's by strengthening the antitrust mechanisms in order to prevent market collusion. We just saw 
uh, that the EU is trying is starting to investigate into Meta, uh, Alphabet, uh, uh, the other one, Apple's, and um, every country uh, has does have the Netherlands as such also does have so-called antitrust uh, legislation eh, in order to avoid that 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 one or two companies will control a market and therefore do start to dominate a market. Those mechanisms are being used. You and I, we can really file a complaint in trying to start an investigation uh, in, in the Netherlands, trying when we have at least a bit of evidence that market parties, companies are, uh, for example, uh, uh, trying to set prices for products. We know the thing now, okay. But in my view, that is always late, always slow, and in the end results in either uh, fines that are doable. You know, uh, I don't mind, but for Google, a million is not a thing, you know. I'm sorry, uh, for me it is, but for them, and I'm, by the way, not, not the least uh, <laughs> um, sad about that, by the way. But anyway, uh, so those mechanisms are there, they're in place, slow, take a long time, uh, not easily uh, started. Uh, the EU seems to be globally a bit leading in, 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 in doing these kind of things, uh, but some will say, yeah, but that is not good for innovation, you know, so. But I think we really need that in order to avoid that those bigger players that we've got now avoid young players to enter markets. Because that's actually what a CEO does of a big corporation, two things I would say. Trying to avoid others to enter the market and try to acquire all the new, you know, interesting <coughs> smaller corporations or uh, startups that are interested. So, and that's why, you know, you stay in control. So as a CEO, basically you don't have to do much and a bit of reputation management don't say too much because that influences the stock market. I'm sorry for my, <laughs> but this is this is, and we need to strengthen. It. We really need to, and that takes courage, by the way. That takes courage because it has consequences. Um, we could say, uh, Marcel could argue perhaps that we need to do it at the EU level. I even think that at the country level, member state level, you could even do it. But it has consequences indeed. Um, but I strongly believe that if Google would fail today, okay, tomorrow we would have a bit of financial disturbance, but after one week, we got more than thousands um, companies that would jump in the, 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 uh, the, the, the gaps and the holes the loop, the, the, that, that Google leaves behind. So we will, I believe in the entrepreneurial spirit of the university, of us as human beings, but it's only the Googles and the Metas and the Alphabets and the Shells that that keep us away from really getting the space to enter the market. Um, finally, yeah, to, to close off, I really believe also that we need to think a bit, you know, not as entrepreneurship as something that is, you know, I want to become rich quickly and, and then retire early. Fantastically fine. I believe in, I, I, I love the freedom as such, but if we just could, 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 could to change that a bit and also think like, how much we all together buy, you know, when I go to a supermarket, I tend to say like 70% of what I can buy here, basically I don't need it, but it tries to make me believe that I need it. So in many cases, I leave a store buying things that I basically never needed, but I always found like, ah, oh, perhaps it could be helpful. This is the affluent society perhaps that we created and that is part of our the, the type of capitalism and the society that we created. Can we scale that back a bit? Can we also dare, do we dare to see that we perhaps didn't need those smart watches that actually didn't do anything to public health care? So that's what I mean with cultural change. Can we also try to involve us in the debate? These are my options. This is now where I leave Marcel to uh, continue. <laughs> Thank you. Applause. Thank you very much, Hoop.
for a very informative uh, talk. And I, uh, as, a, as an historian, I really like the historical bit of it. And that uh, some ideas about uh, big corporations and the influence they have and we can have on them uh, is, is uh, 100 years old. Uh, I have a question about that uh, to start with. Um, you talked about the shareholders idea that a shareholder can take a share in a company and in that way can influence the company and have a voice, a, uh, an influence to make the company uh, um, better serve society. That's a very idealistic uh, point of view, by the way. Um, now I, I'm thinking about Shell, the second talk uh, about um, that big company. Uh, Shell has a lot of uh, shareholders, and uh, some of them, uh, pension funds like ABP and another one uh, which is very big, are going away. They uh, say to Shell, we don't want our, our shares anymore because we don't like what you do and the way uh, in which you try to improve sustainability and, and to, to improve the, the, the climate uh, crisis in a, in a positive way. But if they uh, turn their backs to Shell, don't they lose their voice? What's your view on that? Um, yes, they lose their voice directly as a shareholder. Yes, yes. because they can't say yeah. anything yeah. in the in no, a circle. No, indeed. Um, and um, I don't, you know, I don't believe in the one good or the one bad mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, style of things. Things the context always changes and mm -hmm. therefore uh, you as a historian mm -hmm. would know that as well. So yes, at that point in time when they step out as a shareholder, they lose their voice. Um, but one could say the fact that they do it raises public attention and yes. it's being discussed all over the media, we discuss mm -hmm. it, which also could do something to a corporate like Shell to think, oh wow, yes. important uh, investors are losing trust and faith in us as a corporation. Mm -hmm. And that could also make them change their ways uh, or influence their decisions. And I'm sure it does to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. If I then may uh, immediately uh, use today's world, mm -hmm. uh, we, we've, we, we live in a, in, in a world where I would consider uh, we, we face or we experience a, a geopolitical Kind of a shift mm -hmm. where uh, we also see, you know, when one party doesn't want to invest in us, and there seems to be another world that is openly willing to do, and that's unfortunate, but it's a reality. So even if those big mm -hmm. investors, yeah. So I would therefore perhaps say that those investors could use their shareholdership much more to stay on board and to every time keep on raising the voice. And I think Shell, but Marcel knows the latest on this, Shell had, is dealing with a group of shareholders that at a certain point said like, we, yeah, we at least become shareholders yes. and want to raise our voices to make it more green. Um, that's a way uh, of doing it. But especially the ABPs, the big pension fund, yeah, they've got the deep pockets, they could uh, be more important to that. So yes. whether it's a good or bad thing, mm -hmm. it depends how they use how they use the facts, the acts, what they do. When they pull out to make big noise, like guys, mm -hmm. we don't believe in you yes. anymore. Then it that has would some help, impact. Yeah. Yes. Or to stay on board, and then, but then you need to constantly raise your voice and say, yes. "Hey, but we want the cooperation to redirect." Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, questions from you. Thank you for your talk. Um, your uh, proposed solutions, or at least contributors, uh, were twofold. On the one hand, uh, you had the cultural change, uh, and I think that part was clear how that can contribute. Uh, on the other hand, you also talked about stronger antitrust mechanisms to prevent market collusion. Uh, so that would make sure that there's more actual competition instead of monopolies. How do you think that actually helps to, con uh, to ensure that these corporations contribute to society? Yeah, thanks. 
really, I, I, <laughs> thank you for, for, for your question because I really admire when, when, uh, when, when these sharp questions um, arise and are being directed because it helps to, that's a good, I, th I believe that will help because uh, first of all, if we would use those antitrust mechanisms much earlier or give them a much sharper and activistic kind of a, a behavior that would basically, I think, have resulted in a world where we do have um, not uh, the few players in many of the markets that we have as we have now. Um, I'm using the, word, uh, the, the example of Microsoft. I've, again, I'm, because we had a nice mm -hmm. uh, pre-dinner conversation, a uh, pre-studium pre, um, generale uh, conversation about it. I, I'm using the, word, uh, the example of Microsoft in most cases. Microsoft is a fantastic... How could Microsoft become that big as it became? I mean, you're from a younger generation, but Microsoft really, you know, uh, was all over the place. Uh, it, it, it dominated everything that had to do with, with computers. Um, one could say, yeah, because Microsoft was very innovative. Or very, can't be true. Can you believe that over the decades there was no company or none of us that would have been so smart and come up with better ideas than Microsoft? No, of course not. Because those mechanisms didn't work well or governments didn't want to use it. The Americans, some of them, but most of them didn't want to use it at all. And uh, therefore, Microsoft in the US already grew big, deep pockets, and could easily enter uh, Europe and, and conquer Europe as well. And we allowed it. So we did not, we far too late started to say, hey, but Microsoft is, 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 has become too big. We just didn't dare to, because the major belief was, I believe, since the 70s, the Milton, the Friedman Doctrine, mm -hmm. that you know, free trade, free international trade, free business, we should not have so many barriers for businesses, uh, free enterprise, that's the thing. Once again, I, I love freedom as such, but once again, when it leads to non-freedom because we're in the hands of a corporate, then I'm also not free. Back to your question, um, we've, if we would have used those antitrust mechanisms much stronger, much earlier, in cases like in a Microsoft case, we would not have a Microsoft. We would have many more players around and could have, uh, we had at least much more and freer choice as consumers. Or as, yeah. And um, then at least we would not have one or few big players as we, we seem to, to have in many markets. Um, and really, because you have different players, they will much better serve the interests of, of society rather than, in the end, trying to survive and to um, uh, secure their market share. That would be my line of reasoning. So y because you, you, you um, create that level playing field and open much more open space, you get at least that the multiple players all together are much more willing to really serve the needs of, mm -hmm. of society rather than to secure their own share. That, that's the reason why. More questions. If I understand your question correctly, uh, so employees, governments, a more diversified set of shareholders would help corporations. <coughs> That's what you're saying? Um, a different kind of shareholder yeah. that doesn't just look at money. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, I would. That would help. Um, but the good thing is, uh, I didn't uh, uh, add that to my uh, part of, of tonight, but the good thing is, there are companies around the world that purposefully try to deviate from that stock market paradigm. Yeah? Uh, for example, in the US, you've got a group of companies called Conscious Capitalism. They really purposefully try to, uh, to, to move away and to, to stay out of that stock market-driven paradigm. Uh, and successfully in many cases. I was even surprised when I see some of those uh, CEOs of those bigger... Uh, so there are companies that do dare to say, no, 
it's not our financial performance fantastic. Of course, we need to make profit to stay alive and to run our business and to keep on uh, innovate, etc. But that's not the leading thing, the leading principle. And the same could be with, with shareholders. And we do have those type of shareholders, um, even sometimes the pension fund that you were referring to. Some of them, like some of the banks, they choose purposefully to, 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 to invest in the specific type of so-called better business, call it like this, and also behave not only for the dividends and to act like what brings us the best return on investment, but to really ensure that businesses are, uh, yeah, call it then, uh, easily serve society better than they do now. So there's hope if that is, uh, and those examples, we could perhaps also in our classes, in our business schools, in our business and management education could use much more. And there are many more uh, of those types. So you as you've got conscious capitalism in, uh, I know of in, 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 in Europe, you have economy of communion, which is a set of businesses that tries to do so. Um, I've also, a few years ago, held a, a, some sort of a, a, a public lecture on the role of corporate, uh, uh, corporates, not corporation, but corporates, the cooperatie in Dutch. Um, in Spain, you have Mondragon, which was established by uh, a Jesuit priest, uh, but uh, at least it's, it's one of the biggest corporations based, I think, in, in Bilbao still, in the Basque country. Uh, and what is interesting, for example, one of the things in the U.S., the average CEO, uh, the average CEO is about three, uh, earns about 300 times the average salary of a uh, 300 times the, the average salary. That's, that's quite, a, quite a lot of money, you know. But in Mo at Mondragon, the CEO earns max six times the average salary. And that's one of the principles that that corporation... And it's a big one. It's not... It's, it's active in retail, in finance, in... Many. So it, it takes perhaps... Perhaps that's the answer. Uh, willpower of, of us as human beings to say no... Financial performance is important because we need to survive and need to improve and need to uh, run our business, but it's not the leading principle. And uh, I, I, I think that would help, uh, although I'm not an idealist as such, because I believe, yeah, but that would really help us and also help us in terms of sustainability, our environmental, uh, the, the, the world we live in, to be less extractive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whatever we think of, of climate, etc., because that's quite a you know sensitive topic. But I think we all would be better off if we would be at least less extractive to our planet, as for example, the companies like Shell. Thank you. <laughs> I saw more questions, yeah. but uh, you can ask them after the second lecture. Uh, because I, want, I would like to introduce Marcel Metze. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, Marcel... <laughs> Marcel Metze wrote this book. Uh, you already heard an uh, enthusiastic uh, review about it from uh, Huub. I also uh, read it and it's very well written. It's about uh, 130 years of uh, Shell, from the beginning till very recently. Um, Dr. Marcel Metze is a journalist, a renowned journalist. Uh, he also wrote about Philips, uh, our bank system, and other uh, very uh, interesting uh, subjects. Um, um, this book is in Dutch. We hope the English translation will uh, follow very uh, soon, but working, we are working <laughs> it's yeah. a working, uh, work in progress. Um, about Shell, the ways in which uh, Shell deals and dealt with very different countries, with very different regimes, from autocratic till democratic uh, in periods of war, terrorism, conflict, Shell always survived. How? Please a warm applause for Marcel Metzen. Well, if you want to know how to read the book, I would say uh, it's a long history. This is the shell, the real one. I found it in the south of France, Saint-Marie-la-Mer, 
the Kabarak region on the coast. Very nice uh, specimen of it. Just as big, they can become bigger. I thought I'd open with this. So it exists, the shell. Here's some examples of my, my earlier work. I've been in journalism for about 40 years, 45, I think it's already. Um, I'm a writer. So it, maybe it's an excuse, excuse at the same time that I say this because I'm not a speaker. I'm a writer. I take a lot of time writing. <clears throat> I try my best, nevertheless, to be a speaker tonight. Some works. Worst first book was about Philips Electronics, which was in much difficulty in the early 90s. A uh, book about politics. This is about the Christian Democrat. The second book is about the Christian Democratic Party, which suffered a lot of uh, uh, backlash in the mid 90s. <clears throat> Again, a biography about the, one of the founders of the Philips Electronics Corporation. And um, I was proud for, of that book, especially because it was my academic dis dissertation as well, published in 2004. Here's some more. This, uh, the left one is on, on the banking system. The middle one is on the Dutch Highways and Waterways um, organization, which is actually quite an interesting story because they, uh, in, the, uh, in the early zeros, they transferred from, a, let's say, a very bureaucratic, uh, tech technology-driven organization into a more uh, business-like uh, operation. Uh, and I was able to describe that change from within. They, they allowed me to do that. Actually, the book, uh, the, the project became a big conflict with the, 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 the top managers of this organization, and I had to um, ask Parliament to help me to, to, to get it published anyway. The right one is a short history for anybody who's interested in the history of management <clears throat> as we know it today. You could read this one. It's a little bit of a critical book. It's called The Haughty in, in Dutch, again. Uh, and uh, it, will let, it will make you understand how managers have um, acquired the position they have today. Maybe I pushed the wrong button. Yeah, I did. I also have a, an organization for investigative journalism, a non-profit organization. We call it simply the investigative desk. Actually, I think we are the smallest multinational uh, in the world. We have about 15 to 20 people, and we work now on almost every continent. We have international collaborations with journalistic organizations on every continent except Australia, which is our next goal. Uh, if you want to, if you were interested in what we do, just look up the name on Google. You will get uh, the website. Again, the wrong button. What am I doing wrong? OK. Then, of course, this book. Well, high stakes. If it's going to be translated, that's going to be the title. Because what Shell is playing is a high stakes game. And this title has a double meaning, in my view. It's, it's, uh, the stakes are high. A lot of money is involved. But also, it's a very sophisticated game that Shell is playing, and they developed their game in the course of 130 years. A political biography, because uh, it was clear from the outset that uh, oil and gas is a political business, and has been a political business from the start. Here's a little part of a debate that we have. How do we start the movie? Next slide, okay. Wat ik ook wel wil overbrengen is van... This is in Dutch, sorry. Want dit is wel een speler van formaat. Ja. Uh, en een formaat dat, ik, dat gewoon een on-Nederlands formaat is. Just a small, small fragment for the Dutch uh, audience. Welkom in de Bali. Mijn naam is uh, Tim Wagenmakers. Ik ben uh, nou, jullie uh, gast hier vanavond. Wie een beetje rondkijkt in de wereld en uh, aan het bedrijf Shell denkt... is denk ik genoeg aanleiding om een gesprek te voeren. Dat gaan we vanavond doen. En dan hebben we ook nog eens een fantastische aanleiding. Namelijk dit uh, 
deze baksteen van Marcel Metzen. Hoogspel, de bio- politieke biografie van Shell. <laughs> Kun je, voordat we het boek induiken, ons even heel kort meenemen... waarom je je 25 jaar toch ja, in, in fase is natuurlijk... maar w- wilde verbinden aan dit verhaal? Ik geef de antwoord aan dat. Hij vraagt me waarom ik 25 jaar in writing, writing this boek Well, it's been quite a quite a story. Um, first, I'll give you some facts. Uh, he calls it a brick. It is actually it is. It's about um, 530 pages. I would have wanted to, to make a book of thousand pages, but nobody was going to read that because there's so much to tell about this company. Um, How do you make a book like that? I'll tell, give you a little bit of information about the process, the making of. So the Royal Dutch Shell section in my computer has about 21 gigabytes of data. And they are organized in 22,369 files, divided into 538 folders. Now. 80 of those folders contain about 6,000 pages that I got from the British National Archives. <laughs> and maybe it's nice to tell you, I made a selection of important documents in the British National Archives uh, in three categories, A, B, and C. And I took only the A documents. That, and I sent out a researcher to London to get those documents. And after a few weeks, he said, I can't do it, it's too many. We have to make a subsection of A, double A. So we did that. Those were the 6,000. He photographed them, and it took another researcher about a year to process them all. This was just part of the, of the research. Then we have folders that, about 350 record numbers of the Dutch National Archives. We have documents from the German National Archives, some French archives, from American archives, a lot of archival material. Then there's a database of about 10,000 articles that I collected from Financial Times, Dutch uh, Financiële Dagblad, which is also a financial paper, Volkskrant, NRC, so Dutch newspapers, The Economist, of course. There, there are many more. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, it was a database with 2,500 uh, American uh, diplomatic cables, which was actually selected from the WikiLeaks database. So the WikiLeaks database, which was uh, leaked in 2010, I think, uh, contained about 250,000 diplomatic cables, so from embassies and and, um, uh, consulates all over the world. And, uh, of course, these all contain reports of diplomats with, of the discussions that they have with people from big business, uh, including Royal Dutch Shell. And it, so it took a little bit of smart searching to select the ones because, you know, the word Shell can mean <laughs> something different too. Uh, so to get the right selection was about 2,500. Interesting material because it gives you an insight, very much an insight into the dealings of the, the interactions of the, um, these corporations with diplomats, so with governments. Um, total cost, total, total, total amount of work to produce the book, about 15 years uh, total time investment. I think eight or nine years were done by researchers, so I had a lot of young people doing research Uh, interns, uh, um, young researchers, if they were good, I could hire them for a while. And it's about seven years of work on myself, by myself. Total cost, 600,000 euros. That's about double what I thought it would be at the start. Who's, who fi- financed it? I did, about 85%. 15% was subsidies, a little bit from the publisher, but we're living in a small market. So when I talk to my young journalists, I always say, don't do this. It won't make you rich. 
but it was very interesting to do. So that was the main reason I, I did it. You might say I did, uh, I played a high stakes game myself too, by doing this. I just showed you a little bit of the debate in the Bali. There here's some, some uh, covers after the book appeared. Uh, this is from the Finnish Shailo Dagblad, so the financial paper, the Telegraaf. And here's a shot of the presentation. So the former CEO of Shell, Jeroen van der Veer, was kind enough to accept the first copy of the book. This is at the, at the, um, uh, the publisher's house. Here he is giving a small speech. All right, so this is how the book begins. Maybe you should just read it. These are two, two uh, fragments from the risk section in, in the annual report. Uh, and, and the thing is, if you read it, you know, that this sounds kind of heavy. Risks of social instability, criminality, civil unrest, terrorism, piracy, cyber disruption, etc., etc., etc. Um, and the, th the thing is, for Shell, this is not just risks, but this is day-to-day -day reality. These things happen every day. And it's, for us, it sounds, may sound strange, but every day something is going on in this field for a corporation like that. So it's in their mind all the time. We have to realize that in order to understand how they think, how they operate. This is uh, the guy who started it. Henri Deterding was his name, a young Dutchman. Actually, he didn't quite start it. It went a little different. I'd like to read a small part of the book. So, the book was actually, the, the, the Dutch part of the company, it used to be a British-Dutch company, as maybe you know. It started, the Dutch part started first in 1890, and it was started by a, um, a young explorer, you might say, with good connections in politics. Uh, he found oil in Sumatra, which is now Indonesia. Production started after one and a half years, after they had built up their installations. And then there was a guy who was called Kessler, who was the managing director at the time. So this young company had problems, as many young companies do. And um, more expenses than income. So what did they do? Now, solution came from this young guy, Henry Deterding. He was, at this photo he's 18, but when Kessler met Deterding he was 26, so a little bit older than this, this photo. He was, he was born in Amsterdam in 1866, and uh, at the, after secondary school, he had trained at the Twente Bankvereniging, which was a bank, which or originated actually here in this town, uh, set up from the textile industry, from some textile f factory owner, had been founded here, but had moved to London and to Amsterdam. And uh, Henri Detering worked for this bank. He, was, he transferred in, in 1888 to the, the company that's called the Netherlands Trading Society, which was actually a state-owned company set up by the king, the first uh, king that we had in the early uh, 1900s. And it played a key role in the trade of goods between the Netherlands and its colony in the East Indies, Dutch East Indies. So he was working for this bank. And he... Uh, had been stationed in Medan first, Sumatra, and then Penang, which is a, a port city on an island across the Strait of Malacca, now Malaysia. And Kessler, the director of Shell and of Royal Dutch, knew Deterding, uh, the Deterding family from Amsterdam, and he told him about his, his financial problems. Deterding offered him a financing based on the British model, which consisted of a revolving credit against which unsold stocks of lamp oil would serve as a collateral. Now, for, this seems like a very normal procedure to us now, but this was a financial innovation at the time. 
to use stocks as collateral for funding. Um, lamp oil was actually at that time the basic product of Royal Dutch. There were no cars yet. They didn't sell gasoline yet. It wasn't even used in uh, ships, only a little bit. Diesel was used. Fuel oil, you called it. Then the next problem, this uh, first director of Shalat, was the guerrilla. So under a treaty with the British, the Netherlands uh, was allowed to take possession of the whole of Sumatra, but they hadn't taken it quite yet. Uh, in, the, in the north of Sumatra was still a lot of resistance from Aceh. They, um, so in 1892, the colonial government installed a blockade of the Achenese ports to halt their overseas trees. What happened is that armed groups of Achenese moved south and they also um, came to the drilling site of the Royal Dutch. So on the night of May 31, 1893, 300 men attacked the uh, shell installations in Pankalan Brandan, as the town was called. And Mr. Kessler was there and his 16 white employees. And like, uh, in, a wild we like in a Wild West movie, they hid behind a fence with their guns and shot the Achenese away. Most of the inhabitants of that hamlet around were also behind the fence, so could be saved. Uh, some were injured or killed. We don't know how many of the Achenese fighters were killed. History doesn't record that. And after the rest had withdrawn, Kessler telegraphed, the army, please come and protect us. So why do I tell this story? Because this shows you that at, from the beginning, there's always been a relationship between the oil and gas production and military power. It has always been uh, protected by the military. This has been happening ever since. Yeah. Okay, then we have to move quickly. So here are some, some important issues. So maybe I have to do what I, what I intended to do. We have, I have four issues that I can still discuss, but of course, because I don't have the time to discuss them all, I will, would like you to choose which one of the four you find most interesting. I was getting into the military support. I can continue on that. But there are also... All the, all the, other, the other three are equally interesting, I would say the development of Shell's business ethics, uh, the way they moved away from reputation management to risk management, and uh, in that respect also started their own intelligence service. It's always a very exciting story, so I would recommend that one. And then, of course, um, their environmental policies, the transition to the um, sustainable energy. So who votes for... The last one. <laughs> I would think for, I would think so. And the third one. <laughs> that is the second one. Okay, and the first one? Yeah, well. Now we have, still have a difficulty because there are two. <laughs> let, me, let me move to, uh, to the third. All right? And I'll try to do it quickly. This is actually Henri Dating when he was in, the, at his, in his mid-50s. You will see all. Oh, here we go. So what happened in in the mid 90s? I'm, I'm going to move all the way to the mid 90s now. Is that Shell was in a crisis, and um, the crisis was related to two issues. First was the sinking of the Brent Spar, which was an oil platform in the in the North Sea. Brent's bar, and uh, this was decommissioned, so it was no longer of use, and Shell wanted to sink it in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and uh, this caused a lot of protest from Greenpeace. And it caused division inside Shell as well, which was kind, kind of unusual in 1995. At the same time, the same year, there was a lot of protests in um, 
Nigeria, one of the countries where Xiao was, of course, very active. And um, in, a, uh, in a military trial, one of the activists that were protesting against the oil industry was sentenced to death and was also uh, hanged. Ken Sarawiwa was his name. Um, and Shell was held responsible for that. And the third element was in that crisis was that Shell was reorganizing uh, and this caused a lot of internal turmoil. So there was a threefold crisis in that year going on. And as I describe in the book, is this, in this year, 1995, has been a turning point in the way Shell interacts with society. Before that time, the company was still trying to you know, establish uh, a kind of discourse with society uh, to have a reasonable conversation, you might say. But from this moment on, from this year on, the relationship between Shell and society has been characterized as one of distrust. And Shell has come to see society as a risk factor that needs to be managed. And one of the most interesting uh, statistics that I found is simply by counting the word, the, the occurrence of the word risk in their annual report. If you take the annual report of the year 2000, it will be, it occurred about seven or eight times. Now, 100 times as much. So it's on almost every page, the word risk. Um, after this crisis here in 1995, first Shell started a reputation management project, soon to be followed by a risk management problem, a project. This was an official project program that was um, installed by the, by the board. Now, later we found that the, um, the Brent Spar uh, turmoil, during the Brent Spar turmoil, Shell had actually hired a, um, an intelligence agency, a, 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 not a government intelligence agency, but a private intelligence company in the UK to spy on Greenpeace. This was described in the press later on. <clears throat> what I found is that uh, after 2000, the company also started building up their own intelligence service. And here is number one, Ian McCready, the guy who run it, ran it. So Mr. McCready, he used to be, he was at the helm of this uh, service in 2004 to 2011. And his wife actually exposed him. He, she's a thriller author and she gave an interview and then she said the inter told the interviewer he was a former MI6 spy hired by Shell. He worked for the British Foreign Office for three decades, including in the Middle East, and he was a li li liaison officer between the British and American intelligence services. So, Mr. McCready, he was succeeded by this person, James Hall, who had worked in the same ministry, also a Brit, same ministry, for a quarter of a century, in various roles, but probably the same. And uh, he, he uh, said in, in an interview that he supervised more than 250 people in this corporate security section, as Shell calls its intelligence service, corporate security. And then there was Duncan Manning. He's still the head of Shell Corp Security. Uh, Duncan Manning, is, um, he was a former lieutenant colonel of the British Royal Marines. And uh, he has been responsible actually for dismantling several uh, disabled platforms, oil platforms in the Brent oil field. So he's still... These pictures are all from LinkedIn. You can just find them on LinkedIn. And on LinkedIn, we were able to find during the research that quite a few uh, uh, employees of this corporate security section um, have a history in the police, in the army, navy, uh, FBI, secret service, and uh, especially in difficult countries like Iraq, Shell, Wants to likes to recruit people with uh, uh, experience in the special forces. So they built up more or less, you might say, a, not just an intelligence service, but also kind of a private army. 
here's one who doesn't want to be seen, so I don't have a picture. It's the Crocker Oats. Interestingly, in the United States, if people have um, legal, if they're in legal proceedings, you can find a lot of material about that. So Mr. Crockett Oaks was working for Shell in corporate security, and he got into trouble with Shell Oil, and he filed the complaints. And from that complaints, we know a little bit about what he was doing, because he wrote it down himself, and it's just public information. So this man, um, he earned $325,000 per year, so, which means that these kind of positions are very well-paid positions. What made him valuable was that he was a reserve officer in the United States Army. And as a reserve officer, he had a top-secret security clearance. Now, for Shell, this is interesting, because that means that these people can get, um, secu can get um, se uh, secure briefings from the Pentagon because the Pentagon organizes special briefings for corporations to give them classified information. And you need people who have the, secure, the security clearance. Same with this person. Also, uh, one of the employees of corporate security in the United States also came in a labor conflict, so we could find some details about his work as well. This man has been working in the Secret Service. He was actually part of the uh, Presidential Protective Division uh, in the time of the 9-11. So he was, when 9-11 when occurred, he was uh, protecting George Bush. And after, afterwards, he went to work for the oil industry. First, Conoco Phillips, and then he, um, he went to work for Shell. And in his deposition, after he became into conflict with Shell, he, he described what he was doing. He said he collected, he writes, he collected uh, intelligence, he wrote reports, he, uh, he made sure that security incidents were handled properly, he gave security awareness briefings to managers, uh, and also he, uh, he got briefings from the military. Um, anyway, this is just what we found a small number of these people. Uh, all in all, according to, to this, uh, this Mr. Shater, he also was leading more than 250 people in the United States alone. We also found a speech by Mr. Peter De Witt. He was the director, the CEO of Shell Netherlands uh, in 2010 for a, on a conference in which he said, he explained how this, this organization had been built, built up, and he said, we at Shell, we apply now an all-hazards approach. And we are therefore prepared for every conceivable incident, whatever nature or cause. He explained also that Shell now looks at, divides the world into uh, various countries with various levels of threat. These threats can range from unlikely to extreme. And among high threat countries are countries like Algeria, Brazil, Colombia, Israel, Yemen, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Mexico, Nigeria. I can go on a little bit longer. Dozens of countries are high threat countries. Um, there are many stories uh, also in my book, a special, I, I recommend you to read the OPL, OPL 245 story. I, I can't go into that now, we don't have the time for that. We have still one minute. Still one minute. It is, it is, it's quite important to understand how, how we, if, if we talk to Shell, that this is the way they look at the world now. So it's a, it's a deep mistrust. And um, uh, in the, also in discussions about the energy transition, uh, it will explain that they will not be a front runner in that story, in that transition story, because they are very much aware of what the comp competition is doing and also what uh, the state companies in, for example, China are doing, Saudi Arabia, uh, countries like that, uh, and they don't want to fall behind. I'm sorry you have to end this now. <laughs>
I was going to continue much more on the last issue, but we, maybe we can do that in the yes, question. Yes, maybe we can do it now. You can do it in the question uh, yes, section. Yes, because you, yeah. you, first I would like to have a warm applause. And about the, the spy uh, stories and yeah. the military uh, people involved uh, in, in the risk management yeah. of Shell, you told me that you are going to write more about it in a follow-up yeah. on this book. I think it's quite... Fa I find it a very fascinating story because what, what you see happen is that these global... Co Shell is not the only company that's mm -hmm. doing this. This is, a, this is a development that is you know, happening worldwide in larger corporations. Mm -hmm. So uh, Hooper is telling about, you know, the enormous growth of the number of multinational globalized mm -hmm. corporations. But we do, we, they have to operate in very difficult environments and they want to operate because of the, you know, the need to make a profit. Mm -hmm. uh, and this means that they have to deal with all these failed states and dictatorships, etc. And in order to, to do that, they... Um, uh, develop their own mm -hmm. security services. And these have been developing into you know, private little armies, private intelligence. Uh, they, have, they have people running around all over the world now just to uh, track the um, movements like Extinction Rebellion. They will uh -huh. be, I'm, I'm yes, sure they will be infiltrated Now we are by getting that. to the point, yeah. because you said something about Extinction yeah. Rebellion yeah. right now, but also you said one of your last sentences, Shell will not be a front runner in the energy transition. No, I don't Why think not? so. Well, because it, um, that's the shareholder story that uh, Hoop was talking mm -hmm. about. So the mm -hmm. influence of the big shareholders is, of course, uh, enormous. Um, and they want to make a profit. Well, they are... The, the, the point is Shell compares themselves with the big American corporations, okay. like ExxonMobil. And yes. they are definitely not front runners in the energy transition. And um, in order to uh, be able to, you know, be a, main, to stay a dominant factor mm -hmm. in this oil and gas market, you have to have a high stock price. That's the way they think. Uh, and the price of Shell shares is now lower than, relatively lower than those of the American companies. So what Shell needs to do, and they have a lot of American share shareholders, mm -hmm. this, this is one of the problems also mm -hmm. that faces Shell, mm -hmm. in the, let's say un until the mid-80s, the mid most of the shareholders were European shareholders. So we had a lot of Dutch shareholders, there were French shareholders, there were Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, shareholders, and of course British shareholders. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but then uh, there was a shift to American shareholders. Uh, and now they are the dominant, uh, the dominant uh, ownership of Shell is actually in American hands. So but th are this you means saying that they, right now yeah. that the American shareholders does, don't care about energy transition, sustainability, the climate of only the world? Only a few, only a few, of course. Okay. Yeah, it's the same here. That's just a, a minority. Okay. There is an organization that is trying to. Uh, uh, um, to, you know, to get uh, environmental friendly votes in, mm -hmm. in, uh, of shareholders during the general meetings, general shareholder meetings. And, um, uh, and it's based in the Netherlands, so they, they do yes, that. Yes, we talked them. about it, yeah? uh, yes, okay. without uh, mentioning their name. Their name is? What's it, what's it called again? Follow this. That's follow the this. Follow yes. this. So Not follow, follow this. the money, but follow, no, follow this. this. But yes. you know, they they can get only a very small percentage of votes from the from these uh, okay. from the shareholders, okay. and it's actually the big investment investment funds, of course, who who control yes. the, these uh, yes. the, the but larger follow shares. Follow this makes a lot of noise. So doesn't they make a lot of noise? But if you look at, at the results of the votes, then it's only okay. minor. Peanuts. So that's what that's why I would say this is. I know I couldn't get into yes. what some of the things that Hoop said. You know, I think that the only thing to, the only way that we could have an influence on these big corporations is to have large shareholderships, public shareholderships. Okay. Actually, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a comparison with the Second World War. Mm -hmm. it might, might seem a strange comparison. But one of the biggest transitions and fastest transitions that we have seen, economic transitions that we have seen, was... Uh, at the outbreak of the Second World War, it, it turned out to be possible 
to have a, an enormous transition from a let's say a civil and civil, uh, uh, private economy to a war economy mm -hmm. in, uh, in one and a half, two years. The same when we had the transition to, from coal to oil is also an interesting comparison. That happened in the 50s. This was legislation, so yes, but it was legislation on a European scale. Okay. It was the Germans, it was the British at the same time would ban coal big markets, and then it turned out, and you know, this was very favorable, favorable for yes. the oil companies. Okay, so the governments so are important to make a change. Big yes, I think for big transitions, okay. you need, and, and now again, we are at a turning point, because what we see happening, and this again, war is involved. Mm -hmm. Now we are in, in this situation with the war in Ukraine. We see that Europe European defense industry has to be reorganized. It is much too fragmented, organized on a national basis. The European community is now working on a program to um, coordinate uh, ammunition production, weapons production, and it's a long, it's a long road. Uh, it, will, it might take us another four or five years because the threat is not imminent enough. You know, the threat is just at the borders. Mm -hmm. Ukraine is still mm -hmm. far away. Mm -hmm. As soon as the threat is, in, is going to be, increase, yes. I'm sure that we will see this movement going faster. You can, in this case, you, we can also see the difference between the United States and Europe. The United States has always been at war since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. They have a much more coordinated defense industry. Mm -hmm. There is much more strategic collaboration between the government and the industry. This is also something that I would be very much in favor for, not just for the defense industry, but also for the energy industry. Mm -hmm. Strategic collaboration, mm -hmm. strategic investment um, from the public sector, so from the governments, the European governments, yes, the European, into, the, into, yes, the, yes. into the energy transition would, would, could be very stimulating. Mm -hmm. to, to speed up that transition. Okay. And these okay. are the kinds of things that we should discuss much more, I think. Okay. Okay. Question from the audience. Oh, I see several questions. Um, yeah, I know that Shell has also looked into uh, the future and I had people make prediction about the future. The yeah. energy transition has to happen, but they still invest in oil platforms that yeah. need to go on for 25 years and that's not going to happen. Don't you think it's a one big bubble and when the shell thing that it's gonna pop? Uh, the, actually the, the, um, the annual reports are very interesting. You should read maybe the final chapter of, that I write, wrote in the book because what I did is um, analyze the small print in the an, an annual report, which is always the most interesting, not the big figures, but what's in the back. So the sections on risk, for example, they're all in the back. You should read those. But also, <coughs> Shell analyzed very, very thoroughly what the energy transition would, could mean. So the worst case scenario. Uh, what would it mean in depreciation you know, of their reserves, for example? How much money have they reserved already for decommissioning their installations? Uh, what is the actual uh, value, present value of their refineries, for example? All these things they have calculated and they, will, and they continue monit monitoring permanently. And my conclusion from those figures is that Shell is financially a very, very, very strong company. They almost have no debts at all. They have, for, you know, they, they have uh, reserved billions, I think it's about $20 billion for decommissioning their installations. So that means what you need to do, you know, to, 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 to make the transition, you will need to decommission them faster than you might like to, but they, can do, they could do that. They have the money for it if they wanted to do it. But then the shareholders have to, have to want to do it too. They are also very prepared for all the legal difficulties that they might encounter, all the legal resistance they may encounter, that they are encountering actually. Uh, again, hundreds of millions of dollars have been reserved for that. I think it's about one and a half billion for just for legal expenses. All these reservations are in the annual reports. So they're very, very well prepared. OK. 
Okay, another question. They can, they can take a blow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. And actually, follow up on this question. So, uh, on the more active side, how can it become sustainable in your view? Well, Shell, self, Shell itself would like to say this is something that we cannot do on our own. It has to be <laughs> the entire industry that has to change. And I'm inclined to, um, to support that. So I think they, that we should need to actually... That quite a few people in Shell do want to go faster than they, than they are going right now. So I just want to... You know, I don't want to be entirely negative about the, uh, you know, the inclination or the, the wish to do some change and do it faster. But um, I think we, as a, as, a, as a society, and especially the government sector, should uh, help them do it by putting more pressure. Because that's what, you know, this, I didn't, I didn't uh, do the section about their environmental policy. But one of the, ma of the main things that you can see there is that they have moved forward in the past, so they did their first experiments with electric cars and with hydrogen. It's already dates back 60 years ago. In, this, in the 1960s, they started that already. Uh, but it never came to market. It never came, they never upscaled it. Uh, they never made it big enough. And every time when the shareholders began to complain or when, when they had some financial setbacks, they would kill those programs again. So we need to pressure them more uh, by legis legislation but again, we have to do that on a European scale because if we start doing that from the Netherlands, we're just a very tiny, tiny country. And for Shell, we are really not important. Not very important, at least. We, we are, you know, we're interesting for them uh, because we have good education systems and we can give them the technicians they need, many of them at least. Uh, so that's, that's why we're interesting. For, as a marketplace, we're not interesting for them anymore. Now that the Groningen house is actually stopped, we're not, interest, not interesting as a production country anymore. Uh, so for, as the Netherlands, we cannot do very much. As Europe, we could. I really want to thank you, you both, Marcel Metze and Hupe Well, for your talks. It was very informative. It gave, uh, it gave a lot of uh, room for thought and what we can do with our multinationals and our influence on them. So I would like to hear a big applause for Hupe Well and Marcel Metze. <laughs>